We have two speakers for you today, Tom DiPalantonio, AFL's Global Account Manager for Verizon, and his special guest, Dustin Munchell, who is a Principal Engineer in the Operations Area of a Tier 1 ISP. For some background, AFL stands for America Fujikura Limited, and we are part of Fujikura, a $7 billion global manufacturing and technology leader in the telecom, energy, automotive, and electronics industries. AFL is over a $1 billion company that focuses on fiber optic products and services. AFL's product line offers its customers a comprehensive end-to-end -end solution that starts with fiber optic cable and spans connectivity and equipment to test, install, and maintain the network, conductor accessories, all the way through services and training. And now I will pass it over to Tom DiPalantonio. Tom? So thank you, Barbara. Appreciate it very much. And as we go forward, I want to thank our audience, I want to thank also Dustin for taking part of this. Uh, we did a, a cleaning and inspection webinar not too long ago, and then this. Hopefully, this will be just as effective. Um, so thanks again, Dustin. And as we move forward, any questions you all might have, please send them into the chat, and we'll address those at the end. Um, going forward, what we wanted to do is capture on, on why fiber management, and really these are going to be the key topics that, that we talk about. One is being able to maximize the available space that you have. As the bricks and mortar start to shrink down, so does the opportunity to, to uh, reach out and go deeper into the network. So you have to be more efficient in doing that. Um, how do you future-proof your network? We're going to talk about that as it moves from 10 gig to, to 40 gig to 100 gig to 200, 400, and even beyond. Uh, we're also going to talk about how do you generate revenue faster. What are some of the tips and tricks in doing that? Uh, that also by, by generating revenue faster, uh, you do that also through reducing your cost. Um, what's the cost factor or let's say the value proposition? And then how do you improve your network performance? And very, very important to understand that. Dustin's going to talk a lot about that because through the eyes in which he has seen a lot of networks and their performance and then um, you want to be able to grow at your desired rate. So the purpose of this, too, is to help the audience understand is that you want to buy what you need for that given time, but also that you have good expansion. So with that, Dustin, did you want to chat on this just a, a few few minutes? Uh, yes, Tom. Well, uh, thank you for having me uh, uh, join you all again. So a lot of this, so why do we deal with fiber management? And I always use it from the perspective of the technicians. So, you know, from a technician's perspective, they don't want to be walking into a space and find that they need to deal with a mess on their hands. So, but yes, it, it also ties into uh, network growth, uh, um, you know, generate revenue faster by being able to put in orders quicker and having to deal with reduced Cost with uh, as far as installation time as well as uh, um, uh, further maintenance with regarding to improving your network performance and future proofing your network. You know, we'll see later on where we have a, a couple scenarios that you know people didn't necessarily plan for the future and they have a mess on their hands that they have to deal with. So yeah, you gotta you gotta be able to deal with your fiber management with inside your networks to be able to grow your network. No, it's a it's a that's a great point and a leading segue into our next slide, which, hey, if, if uh, I'm going to give you a work order to go run this order, here's a, here's a perfect example of how would, you, how would you deal with this nightmare? Yes, certainly. So when you walk into a space, especially like you see there on the left, um, you have a lot of cables, uh, uh, jumpers, et cetera. So if you're walking into a space like that, you have the potential of causing additional network outages simply because if you're wearing a tool belt, maybe your tool belt gets caught on one of those uh, um, cables that are strung uh, within your your work area. Also, too, you, you run into these spaces sometimes where the lighting isn't always the best, so you can't necessarily see everything. Um, you have all these additional cables that are in your way. And also, too, it, it's a safety concern. You know, if you're walking into this space and you do have the poor lighting situation, the cables aren't managed properly, and you happen to trip and fall over one of them, 
Uh, you know, it could end up being a triple whammy where you've caused not only a network outage, you've also hurt yourself in the process. So uh, uh, proper fiber management and cable management in general is uh, very important from the technician's perspective that's there on site, especially, uh, as well as all the other items that we touched on previously. But from the technician's perspective, especially because, again, as I mentioned or, uh, a minute ago, they're the ones who are working in this space and, and dealing with, uh, as you see here, the spaghetti junction. Yeah, that's, uh, this is really um, um, a, a, a poorly uh, built system over time, you can tell. Hey, as we advance forward here, you know, we wanted to capture the slide. You and I talked about this. Um, success and failure. We're, we've talked about, you know, there's there's uh, detailed Telecordia documents for how you how you do what you do, um, as well as access front and back. And why don't you tell the audience a little bit about, you know, multiple touch points, as you can see, and how the one on the right is well dressed as opposed to the one on the left. Correct. So when you're looking at a uh, panel such as uh, the two here in the examples. Um, when you have fibers that are not managed very well, you deal with things like bend radius potential issues, uh, and that's where you have the fiber that's bent beyond the, the radius that's intended for the jumper itself. And what that means is, is that the light will then bounce outside of the, uh, you'll, have a, you'll have a light loss issue, okay? Not to get too in, in depth in that, but also too, the way the fibers are dressed, you see the one on the uh, um, right has a lot of nice sweeping curves. Uh, there's none of the fibers are really bent beyond the bend radius capacity. And I, when I mentioned bend radius, you know, think of it like a hose. Okay, so if you take a hose, if you go outside in the backyard and you have your hose turned on and you bend your hose, right, you're going to have lower water volume coming out of the end of the hose. Uh, light can kind of act the same way. So when you bend your fiber beyond a certain capacity, less light will come out of the end of it. And there's a few other things we'll touch on later that can potentially happen. But, um, you know, having those nice sweeping bends within the back of the panel that certainly assists with a lot of your potentially uh, potential bend radius issues. Also, too, if you're trying to do any sort of uh, management with inside the panel on the left, it's going to be very difficult when you're dealing with uh, a 144 panel or, or whatever the volumes are and you're trying to get your fingers inside those panels to go ahead and extract uh, connectors and do your inspect and cleaning and, and your troubleshooting and hooking it up to a set. That's a great point. So Dustin, when we put this slide together on the good, bad, and the ugly, we wanted to show the audience of um, where a good fiber panel, if it's not maintained well, or even if it's established well, where it could be uh, or where it could go to. And I wanted you to talk more about that. Yeah, certainly. Um, so let me just kind of start with the ugly and we'll finish with the good. I always like to end on a good note. So looking at the ugly, as you can see here, you know, when I'm a technician and I approach that particular uh, um, nest of yellow jumpers, that really just doesn't make my day. You know, I, I look at that and say, oh, gosh, I got to go ahead and work inside that particular environment. So there's a lot of issues there, obviously, you know, it doesn't present a very good image as to how you, uh, how your company and or your team takes care of the network. Um, so it, it does have sort of a uh, uh, poor uh, um, image, if you will, of the way the network may be, be taken care of. But also, too, there's a lot of potential there for outages for other services if you're trying to work and do maintenance or uh, installation or disconnects on that particular uh, ugly route. And we don't want to see that, obviously. That's not something that you want to see on a regular basis. It just makes things, it just doesn't make your day. It makes things frustrating when you got to work inside that type of environment. Um, moving on to the bad. So what you have here is a lot of cases where jumpers may have a bend radius problem. Okay, and, and as I mentioned, with bend radius, so I kind of use the analogy with bend radius like a hose. You know, if you go in the backyard to your hose and you turn your spigot on, you take your hose and you bend it in half. Well, the volume of water that's going to come out of that uh, hose is going to be less. Uh, light is the same way. So if you take a fiber jumper and bend it beyond a bend radius capacity, uh, by the way, excluding BIF fibers, okay, we'll talk about that later, bend insensitive fibers. 
um, standard legacy jumpers, if you bend them beyond a certain bend radius capacity, uh, it will lessen the volume of light that's coming through it. So you could have uh, um, potential issues there. But also, too, the way the jumpers are kind of crisscrossed from one another, if I'm trying to do maintenance work on the car that's in slot number two from the left, and I have a jumper that's plugged into slot number three from the left that's right in front of it, and I can't do any sort of maintenance or do a card swap of card number two because that jumper that's plugged into card number three is in my way, well, guess what? Now I'm potentially taking two customers out of service. So uh, we have bend radius issues there, jumpers that are kind of crisscross in front of one another. It's, it's obviously not a good scenario. Um, then ending on the good, so there you see a very well-managed uh, fiber routed piece of equipment. Jumpers have nice clean sweeps. They're managed properly. They're utilizing all the paths that are there in a correct form. Uh, and it just looks, it looks nice and it, it presents a well-managed network. Yeah, and I wanted to take that good slide and really expand on it in the best practice. So, you know, you and I have talked about this, and I know you're going to go more into details, specifically on the one on the left. But you know, what through scalability and flexibility that we talked about from the beginning, um, some of the things that you know I'd like you to hit on, uh, Dustin, is you know like the small form factor, right? As the as the platform starts to shrink and the connectors start to get smaller. Uh, you know, there's different uh, scalability, but flexibility of these platforms by having different trays, having different cassettes that can plug in. As you can see, the one on the right has uh, latching mechanisms because the connectors are becoming very, very small. So they, um, you know, so it's built that way. Um, you know, what's your thought on best practice, uh, especially starting with the slide on the left? So yeah, the uh, um, what you see here is you'll have different panels and and different different flavors from varying manufacturers as far as uh, the different uh, um, ways fibers can be routed and and as we grow or as we transition our networks into uh, uh, higher volumes and smaller spaces, that's becoming more and more of uh, fiber routing is becoming more and more of a uh, um, necessity. So, you know, you've had in some cases where you had a panel that supported 144 fibers in a uh, um, maybe a uh, thinking it may be an eight or 10 RU space in a rack. And now you have them where they can be double, triple, quadruple that in a much smaller RU space in a, a rack unit space. So the size of the jumpers become smaller. Uh, the connector sizes become smaller because they can be, uh, uh, you can get them higher volumes within a particular panel. Um, and that means too that a lot of cases there may be requirements that you might need smaller diameter jumpers. Uh, you know, our legacy jumpers may be 2.0 millimeter and some of the newer panels may require that you use 1.6 or 1.2 millimeter jacketed jumpers. And that just means the outer diameter uh, is a bit smaller and it's going to be a bit uh, supportive of the higher volumes inside those tray clips. Uh, the other thing that I tend to do, and, and I tell this to everybody, when it, whether it's fiber or whether it's copper, whether you're dealing with an old school DSX or pots or what have you, you know, I kind of take a piece of equipment and or a panel and I split it in half, right? So, you know, I kind of consider that middle segment the DMZ or the demilitarized zone. Um, and I do not cross that segment or that section, right? That, that invisible line, that invisible border. So any connectors that on a piece of equipment or on a uh, fiber panel, whether it's a MUX or a fiber panel or a, uh, a piece of network uh, equipment, I kind of split it in half and I take all my jumpers and I route that those that are on the left-hand side, they go out of the left-hand side, and those that are going into the right-hand side go out of the right-hand side. And, you know, so I continue that sort of uh, um, rule to ensure that I don't have an overabundance of connectors going out on one side, because as you can see, those clips are not necessarily designed to manage all of the jumpers that are inside that panel. Um, so 
And, and that, and again, that rule is not a new rule. It's something that, you know, we've held true for a long time within the copper network, or we should hold true in a copper network, but I've seen evidence where it doesn't always hold true. Um, so yeah, the fiber management clips are there to prevent number one, bend radius issues. Number two, uh, they kind of, as you manage those trays and slide them in and out in those cassettes, uh, and you move them in and out to add orders or disconnect orders, they kind of keep your jumpers also out of the way to prevent them from getting pinched inside the panels as you close the uh, as you close the doors and and slide the trays in and out. Uh, so there's uh, and they also to keep the bend radius uh, rules adhered to. Yeah, that's a great point. And that really sets us up for the you know the next part, which is fiber slack, right? Spooling, and how do you do it? And you know how you should really spool the fiber if it's, uh, you know, you have too much slack or sometimes when it's, uh, you know, if the jumpers are too short. So um, I'm going to throw this over to you. What's your, uh, what's your thought on this? Sure. Uh, so when it comes to fiber slack, it, it usually begins either at, you know, I always kind of say that fiber slack begins with either one, the decision of the technician to grab the right length jumper or two, um, the network planners and the engineers who designed the installation and ordered the length of cable that was necessary to connect the piece of equipment. So uh, um, you kind of have two areas there that you have to be mindful, and it all has to come down to what is the proper length. So the spooling mechanisms that you see on a lot of newer equipment, and, and actually they've been around for a little while, um, these spooling uh, mechanisms are there to are there and designed to support any additional slack. Uh, they have obviously the sweeping bends to support the bend radius uh, requirements necessary to uh, route fiber, um, but there are some rules that are involved with these spools. Uh, you know things like don't zigzag jumpers, don't double wrap around the same spool. And most of the manufacturers who have these designed within their network, they have some of them even come with little booklets and and little you know images to say what to do and what not to do. Uh, so you know if you adhere by if you adhere to those rules, you'll usually be in pretty good shape. But when you zigzag and double wrap around spools, you're going to create yourself a problem over time when it comes to managing, adding additional circuits or disconnecting. You know, if you're trying to disconnect a circuit when it's double wrapped around a spool, that's gonna cause some problems. You're not gonna be able to get that out of there. And especially as the network grows, you see the image on the uh, um, left, that's just two circuits. So we're at the very beginning, the infancy stage of that piece of equipment as it's being installed and, and grown. Um, so as equipment and as circuits are added to that and you add additional fibers, obviously those spools are going to get very utilized and congested. So over time, if you don't begin the management properly, uh, you're going to create yourself more problems as you grow the network. Now, when you look at the um, best practice comparison, and this kind of, you know, the last slide that leads into the, the one on the left here of proper management, we're talking about the, you know, the drip loop and it's, uh, you know, adequately to be able to manage the breakout, um, as opposed to that on the right, um, which you're, I know you've seen this before, you and I both have seen a lot of this, um, especially, you know, the fiber slack and just uh, allowing that spaghetti junction to the right. What's your, what's your thought of why this happens? Certainly. So what you, you where it, it, it's a number of things, right? So what you typically have is on the right during an installation of a piece of equipment, um, it begins obviously with good engineering, right? Good engineering, proper engineering, uh, ensuring that your lengths are, are documented and, and uh, um, all the supplies that are ordered for whether it's the jumpers or the uh, um, cables are engineered and ordered correctly as far as the lengths are concerned. That way you don't have to manage uh, a whole lot of excessive slack and you can have a nice uh, drip loop and, and bend radius that's going into your equipment. Um, secondly, it has to do with proper training. And, uh, um, you know, I always say that 
you know, good fiber management and good equipment installation begins from the very beginning. So if you have a good, well, and neatly installed piece of equipment and the fiber management is done very cleanly, uh, very neatly, usually that's going to initiate additional well-managed, proper managed fibers after that. Meaning, if you start out having a good, if you start out with a very good job, usually the people that are going to follow, you're going to continue that work. If you start out with a very poorly managed fiber network or piece of equipment installation, usually the folks that are going to follow that are going to use that as a uh, um, reason to not clean it up or not do it properly. They'll, they'll use that as their reason to continue the poor practices. Um, so, you know, once you start with a good, clean installation, usually you see good, clean installations thereafter uh, in and around that particular piece of equipment because you don't want to be the guy that kind of had a, you know, ugly sore thumb sticking out when somebody did a really, really neat and proper and clean installation. Um, so also, too, you'll have uh, um, scenarios where in the image on the right, the jumpers are all, obviously we've mentioned this prior, the jumpers are all zigzag, they're, they're knotted together, and trying to do a disconnect, for example, out of something like that, or trying to trace out a jumper um, with, uh, to try to figure out which one is yours is gonna be a real problem within the rat's nest that you have there on the right. Yeah, that's it. And we're gonna talk about that in just a couple more slides. You know, as we go forward, I think this is another image of what you um, were just talking about, especially the one on the right with um, incorrect, uh, in, and again, incorrect running of jumpers that are not managed properly from, you know, de perhaps design or just what they had, um, you know, for use at the time, right? As you can see them hanging down. Um, this is another great image of what you don't want to do on the right and obviously a, a great image of what you do want to do on the left. Don't you agree? Absolutely. So, yeah, with uh, um, especially the image on the top, um, a lot of that uh, on the right uh, top image, a lot of it has to do with, you know, proper training, uh, making sure that the technicians that are doing the installations understand the rules that are in place or what you expect of them for the installation, uh, things that you don't want them to do, um, you know, and then also too having a good adequate auditing that's going to occur after the fact so that way you can go back and, and reinforce those those rules because not doing it correctly it's just going to expand over time and, and you're going to have a uh, further mess on your hands. But the image on the bottom, a lot of times, uh, when you see something like that, where you see jumpers that are just strung across relay racks uh, in a network uh, uh, center environment or in a central office or at a customer prem or, you know, CEV, whatever it might be, uh, when you see jumpers that are ran across that, th there's a couple things that are happening there. You know, number one, it's, you know, we got to get the order in right now. And we can't wait on something to be re-engineered if we don't have a path between lineup A and lineup B. Um, so, you know, the, the final last words is always, we'll go back and fix it. Well, then it, two years, three years later, it's always, yeah, we'll go back and fix it. And it's never going back and fixed. Uh, but having that, you know, open line of communications between the field and the engineers to say, hey, you know, we need to have an additional path between two lineups to, you know, correct this particular type of uh, um, fiber run here that you see in the bottom image. Uh, you know, that, obviously there's a lot of bad things that are happening there. Uh, you know, you have the jumpers that are kind of crossed over AC lighting and, and they may exceed some sort of uh, drip loop or they could cause a bend radius problem, or for that matter, they are a safety concern. You know, if the lighting is inadequate in that particular space, the technician could walk right by and, you know, get hung up right in their head by the fiber jumpers that are strung right across the relay rack. So, uh, um, yeah, that's, but usually when I see this in the field, it's, it's the famous last words are, we'll go back and fix it. <laughs> yeah, we've heard that quite a number of times, haven't we? 
as we move forward into fiber routing, um, you know, with with the amount of fibers that are being deployed, and we're going to talk a little bit more about connectorization and how that is reduced. But before we get there, there's a good example with some of the trays and and you know what can happen when you start putting more and more jumpers on top of one another. Um, one is that you can have some type of um, macro bend, and we know what the macro bend. I'm going to let you, uh, Dustin, talk about what a macro bend turns into, as well as you know crushed fibers that we see to the right. So, what's your thought on this? So yeah, um, and again, this kind of goes back to that open communication between your operations teams and your planners and your network engineers, and and uh, um, or maybe if you're in an environment where you do your own network planning and engineering, you know, just kind of planning for growth. So here you see with the images on the right, the plan for growth is obviously exceeded the uh, um, uh, capacity of the pan duct that was ran there, the, the duct work there, the uh, uh, kind of orangish uh, duct work that you see. So the technicians in the field, uh, you know, the covers that are supposed to go over top of it have busted at the seams and, and uh, um, kind of looks like your uh, waistline at Thanksgiving. So, uh, um, you know, using Velcro to kind of keep everything tied in correctly. Uh, but again, that goes back to that open communication between your operations teams and your uh, uh, field engineers and your network planners. So they can go ahead and then plan for transitioning that uh, that fiber work maybe into a newer piece of duct work to accommodate all those uh, all those volume, uh, that large volume of fiber jumpers. Uh, but as those jumpers lay in there, you know, if I'm trying to do a disconnect on uh, a jumper that's in the bottom of that uh, pile, it's going to be difficult for me to pull that jumper out to perform that disconnect. Uh, so I can, you know, have that space freed up for newer services if I need to go ahead and add additional. So, um, you know, it, it again, it goes back to uh, network planning and, and ensuring that you're going to be able to accommodate the volumes that your network is planning for and future proofing future proofing the uh, um, uh, installations. Yeah, that's uh, that is a a a nightmare when you don't future proof, and I think that's you know what it when we spoke about it on the first slide of what this webinar series was going to be about. You know, one is obviously future proofing. How do you do it? And this is a perfect slide of that. Uh, another is, um, you know, uh, scalability, right? Um, if you're going to scale it or let's say the design is for growth, which it should be over time, is how are you going to handle that? And, uh, you know, the slide or I should say the pictures to the right uh, shows that that wasn't handled properly over the time, whatever that course of time uh, has been. You know, uh, going forward, we're looking, uh, we're getting close to the end of this webinar and wanted to bring in some of the best practices. So what should it look like? And, you know, what we wanted to do is capture various, um, whether it be vertical or horizontal, um, you know, to, of the different bend radiuses as well as attachments, whether it be like the extended latch tabs, as you see to the right, and the trays of the cards. and you know, this is the way it should be. Don't you agree, Dustin? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and a lot of, and here's one other thing that I do want to kind of touch on, and, and varying, varying corporations and manufacturers have their own installation standards that they have spent a lot of time designing, writing up, and, you know, implementing within their company or their uh, uh, instruction manuals. So you'll have things like, you know, the there's Telcordia guides, there's sometimes internal practices that various corporations may follow for installation standards. But also, too, don't forget that the, the manufacturer of that piece of equipment has a lot of times instructions in there on how to properly run your connectors uh, and what to do and what not to do. Uh, they've taken some time and also incorporated that. So don't forget that, and, and don't forget when you're in the field, you know, you may need to pull out the manual and see during an installation, you know, what should the proper routing be? A lot of these uh, pieces of equipment 
especially uh, um, network gear, has fiber routing management built into the bottom trays or the top trays, depending upon how the fibers are routed inside that piece of equipment. And they have rules that are already dictated and put in place inside their documentation. So don't forget about that and, and, and you know, read up on your information and, and properly educate your field to understand how the fiber routing should be on a particular piece of equipment because it's not always the same. Different manufacturers have different methods on how they've done it. So take some time and, and read up on that and educate your field and educate your team and educate yourselves on how the fiber management should be with that particular piece of equipment. So just we're gonna we're almost at the back end of the webinar right now. We're gonna talk about some best practices, a couple slides of best practices for for the fiber routing. Now part of that though of making sure that it's routed properly is that the beginning part, which is even prior to making sure that uh, it's um, uh, managed properly, and that is you have to have it cleaned. We talked about that in the last webinar with the cleaning and inspection and the percentage of it. So you can do all the right things of fiber routing, but you also have to start with it cleaned and also inspected. Don't you agree? Absolutely. And, and if I may add one other thing, you know, since our, our focus is on fiber routing, if you go back to some of those images with the rat's nest of jumpers that you're dealing with in front of a piece of equipment that has a magnitude of fiber jumpers. They've, they've just grown so exponentially over the years um, with how many fiber connectors are within a particular piece of equipment. You know, one of the things that we talked about on the last webinar was making sure that you not only clean the connector, you also clean the bulkhead that you're plugging into. It's very difficult to access that bulkhead if you have a bird's nest of jumpers all around it and you're trying to get your fiber cleaning equipment inside that bulkhead to inspect and clean. So, you know, the two are kind of tied together in that, you know, I can't properly clean a bulkhead if I can't get to it. So if I can't get to it, then I may make the excuse that I'm not going to clean it and, and inspect it because I can't get to it. And I can't get to it because the fibers have been mismanaged for however many length of time it's been there. So we're gonna have a slide that, show that, that shows that rat's nest as you discussed. I think it's the next slide or one right after that. Um, and we'll point some of those things out that you had mentioned. You, you know, what's also important is, is we get further down the line of larger uh, quantities of fiber. Um, this has always been around, but strain relief. You know, you've talked about bif fiber, bend and sensitive fiber. There's so many different series of that now. There's also UBIF, which you can even you have a tighter bend. The problem happens, though, is that you got to have the proper strain relief, and that depends if it's an older legacy product or even in a newer product today. Uh, what does that look like? You know, take, a, take a minute to talk about what strain relief should do and why you should have it. So the strain relief a lot of times is just uh, um, taking the stress and taking the uh, um, pressure off of the connectors. So when you have connectors that are plugged into a, uh, a network panel or in a piece of equipment, you know they, you don't wanna have excessive amount of strain on those connectors where it's going to potentially create a bend radius issue, especially on older fibers. As you mentioned, bend insensitive fibers. So back to my analogy with the hose, bend insensitive fibers, if I took that, that um, hose and bent it in half, the water would still flow out of it if it were a quote unquote bend insensitive fiber. Same thing with, with jumpers. So when I bend that fiber, you know, significantly beyond the bend radius allowance, right? Not, not pinching it in total half, but, you know, significantly beyond the bend radius, uh, light is still going to transition out of that connector with very little adverse effect. Um, but you still want to have that strain relief at the connector because you know you're not going to be able to have connectors plugged into a piece of equipment and have them banjo tight and they're going to begin to you know put a lot of stress and a lot of strain on that uh, boot of the connector so strain relief you see a lot of times where there'll be a loop a service loop if you will to kind of help with some of that strain also too as you see with the image there in the upper right hand corner uh, you'll have fibers that may be routed 
through channels that have some sort of protective plastic or you'll have connectors that are tied to um, framing uh, equipment inside the uh, uh, inside the space that are protecting the connectors from whatever it's being however it's being adhered to the frame meaning if you're using wax twine if you're using tie wraps whatever that uh, um, connection is to the frame uh, you would have some sort of protective wrap in, in the field we usually call it fish paper um, or you may have some other form of way to protect that connector and that's just to prevent any sort of long-term friction on that connector and and potentially reducing that flow of light if you will but also to protecting it from any kind of over uh, any sort of vibrations where it might begin to uh, create friction and rub on the connector as you see there in the upper right hand corner yeah that's a, that's a great point um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to also address as you future proof your network, you know, one of the things is whether you're using the, well, you're going to use the patch cables on the left as well as the trunk cables. The, the neat thing about how the industry has moved is, you know, years ago you'd have variety of connectors and then you had variety of lengths and then depending on the, you know, the, 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 um, whether it's a six or 12 pack and how it was laid out. Um, today, what's neat is that you have, uh, whether it's patch cables or trunk cables, the ability to have polarity reversible. So whether it's polarity A or you have to reverse it to B, you can do that with the same cable. You don't have to buy two different series of, of uh, whether it be patch cables or trunk cables. Um, also, uh, when we talk about like uniboots or extended latches, uh, some slides uh, prior to this one, it showed a blue extended latch. So when the tray um, is recessed and you need to uh, take out that small form factor connector, um, you're not getting your hand, the technician doesn't have to put their hand in there and disrupt uh, other uh, active fibers. So they're able to do that um, because of um, technology such as the extended latch. And then another thing on the trunk cables is that we call it gender reversible, meaning that instead of having, well, I have cords that are, especially in the MPO world, they're pinned or non-pinned, so they make that connection. You can actually change the polarity, A to B, but then you can also change whether it's a pinned or not. So now that connector becomes very useful or scalable, flexible um, in your network. So you're only dealing with one, one connector, one jumper, and you can change and morph it according to your, you know, your your design. Um, it also has pre-terminated uh, breakout lens and and then pulling eye, um, as you can see for the for the grip option. So there's a lot of advancements and innovation that's going on in fiber routing today. It was passed on. The the key is whether it's going to be used or not by the technician or by the by the companies. Now the next one is. You know, if we go back a couple slides, you'd mentioned about the rat's nest on the left. You know, this picture, um, Dustin, yeah, I hate to say it was taken, and um, when it was uh, provided to me was of a new build just recently, probably within a couple years. And and I think that's probably where you inherit a mess. And, and that's something new. So that's not, this isn't an old picture this is a very new picture of a new network. And it's really a shame because someone has to go in there and troubleshoot. And as we talked about, when you inherit a mess, it's all right, well, what do you do to troubleshoot it? And on these slides here or this slide, I wanted to show that there are some ways, uh, especially as you, you know, as you move into more of the multi-fiber, whether it's a fan out or whether it's an MPO of 12 fiber connector to a 12 fiber or a 24 to a 24 in one connector and the ribbon cable. Uh, you have the opportunity of using, uh, and, and still this has been an old technology that's been advanced called optical fiber identifying. And you're able to see if you have light, not traffic, but light on that fiber. Um, the, the technology to the right allows like that rat's nest to the left is a multi-fiber identification system. So you're able to put multiple lights over, over that fiber and detect whether it's active or not. And then 
last but certainly not least is the ability to measure power. So today, because this isn't going to go away, it's still out in the system, which is inheriting a mess. Um, companies have to produce products to be able to help the technician find and run trouble, run, um, you know, to, to find where the issues are, whether they be the brakes or some type of, as, as you mentioned, Dustin, hoses that are bent and, uh, you know, leaking water. And in, in this particular case, um, you know, maybe leaking some light out. So um, not sure if you wanted to touch on that uh, at all. Uh, yeah, so it's, and, and as you mentioned, if this is a, uh, you yeah, know, with this being a new install, it's it's going to make things a lot more difficult as it goes, as things progress. And and the reason for that is, is that if you ever did want to take the time to try to fix that, obviously you would be taking services down to go ahead and try to correct that and, and make that a little bit neater. So it's uh, um, it's sort of a shame where you know, you would end up having to take and you can see how many fibers are there and, and take that volume of fibers out of service or, you know, intermittently drop certain customers at certain periods of time as you try to go through and fix that. Um, it's so, yeah, it, it all begins at installation. And uh, once you are presented with something like that and once you inherit that kind of mess, it makes it extremely difficult to try to fix. And uh, um but no, you're right. There are definitely tools out there to go ahead and try to run your traces and, and uh, um, uh, locate your fibers and, and various OFIs and, and uh, fiber identifiers and, and so forth. Uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of running your fingers across it and try to figure out which one's yours. But as you go through and try to do a uh, installation or a disconnect on that particular uh, mess and you there's a lot of potential there taking other customers out of service in the process yeah you're not kidding that's uh i wouldn't want to run trouble on that one i think i'd pass um so we're at the last slide and you know what we've done is a checklist here of fiber routing best practice summary and you know one two and three dustin network and infrastructure planning i think you talked about that with the engineering you know make sure the engineering is sound and the planning and then the, the, just like the manufacturers, uh, they all send documents out to follow, whether you follow them or not, is whether you build your foundation and you anchor into something solid. And then obviously it goes to the installation. Um, and then obviously, which, which is, uh, you know, we've seen over time, uh, Dustin is uh, network documentation has, you know, if, if it hadn't started early on, then it just, it, it um, you know, it, it doesn't get better right it's very difficult to get better and so we wanted to put this checklist together after you and i talked and didn't know if you want to just uh, touch on any of this since it's our last slide certainly and and as you pointed out and when it's not taken care of from the very beginning it'll snowball and uh, um again it's you know when you initiate when, when you first start out with bad practices and bad uh, um uh, fiber routing then you have sort of given those that come in behind you the carte blanche or the excuse, if you will, uh, to continue that bad practice. Uh, so if you start out with a very good, clean, well-managed uh, installation, it'll it'll continue that good pro uh, that good practice. Uh, typically, will continue that good practice uh, on through. Uh, but the other thing, too, that um, this all of this kind of ties into is growth of the network, you know, and as you need to swap out equipment and be able to manipulate different pieces of equipment with inside your network, it makes things a lot easier when everything's managed neatly to switch out equipment, upgrade equipment, move equipment around, uh, whatever the case might be. It really definitely makes things a lot easier when it's managed properly to go ahead and try to stay current, try to upgrade your network, try to uh, increase your volumes, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And as we go forward here, we know that um, throughout this uh, uh, presentation that we've been taking questions. So we're going to address as many questions as we can um, during, you know, during the, uh, uh, the time that we have left. So, Dustin, I have a couple uh, questions that uh, came through the chat room. 
I think the right. first one, let's, let me uh, go through. All right, here we go. Um, it's difficult to always know how long of a jumper I need. Is there a better way to have the length predetermined? So I just need to grab and go knowing my jumper will be long enough, but not too long. Huh. Okay. Uh, yes, actually, there's a, a little trick that I uh, employ. So what I'll do is I'll take a piece of twine, measure it out, you know, take a little Sharpie marker and mark out, you know, one meter, two meter, et cetera. And if there's a panel or a set of uh, um, LGXs that I commonly use, I'll just take that piece of twine and sort of run it and get predetermined lengths and kind of identify those. And I'll write and I'll jot them down on a piece of paper and I'll go ahead and uh, um, maybe make myself a little job aid. And that way I know that if I'm going from point A to point B, it may be this predetermined length, point A to point C, point A to point D, et cetera. And then also too, some of the uh, um, uh, very intricate uh, fiber panels that ex that exist on the market. Some of those do have uh, little booklets and and little charts that tell you and guide you what length of jumper you might need if you're going from panel one to panel seven, and you have X number of uh, um, bays in between. You know you might need this length jumper. So yeah, there there's a couple little tricks there to kind of get your uh, self worked out beforehand. All right, thank you. Um, I got another one here uh, about bend radius. Dustin, this is to you. So it, you talked about bend radius. When a fiber is bent, how can I find that in that bird's nest of jumpers that may span between several floors and a large number of bays? Yeah, so yeah, if you do have uh, in larger network data centers, central offices, et cetera, um, where you have jumpers that are ran across a very long span between multiple floors, et cetera. Uh, there are tools out there that exist. There's uh, things like uh, red light um, that you can use as a fiber identifier. There's also uh, various OTDRs and intelligent OTDRs that exist on the market today. And they can actually pinpoint length as far as where there may be a bend radius issue, where there may be a bad connector, dirty connector, et cetera. So there are products out in the market that can that can help you identify where your bend might be and even also uh, uh, cleanliness on the connectors. It can identify where you have a dirty connector. So yes, the, uh, those do exist. And typically they're found within varying OTDRs and intelligent OTDRs. Yeah, that got really, um, uh, you know, that kind of talks, um, talks about, <clears throat> pardon me, talks about like return loss, right? Because the cleanliness is also affecting the optical return loss, which obviously the intelligent OTR can pick up as well. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Let's see. Uh, also want to invite on uh, Mr. Kevin Clayton. He is uh, our senior product manager for Inside Plant. I have a question uh, that came in the chat room, Kevin, for you. Um, it says, Based on the high density platforms, what is now the advantages of front, rear, and top entry? What can you can you describe or uh, give an overview on that? Absolutely. So I think there's two aspects to that. The first aspect is going to go to kind of the the design intent from the from the very beginning enabling its scalability okay so when you're thinking about where your network is going I think there's just a sheer amount of fiber as you discussed throughout here that you could have really requires if you're going to try to scale that you really have access you know in the front and in the rear and on the top to be able to get in there very effectively and allow the technicians to to do ads and drops as they go to to grow the network and then the other piece, obviously, is, is when you think about the, the maintenance side of things. And when you do get that many fibers in, in a panel, again, some of these high-density panels now, you, you have a lot of fiber and a lot of money running through um, those, those bandwidths that are coming in and out of that panel. So you want to be able to get to those fibers very effectively after the fact. 
and having access from the front, from the rear, and then also from the top kind of enables you that ability to get in there without disturbing a lot of the other fibers around the individual ports that you're trying to get to. So it doesn't really matter whether it's an LC or whether it's an MPO, uh, having that access in front, back, and top really enables you to get in there effectively and do ads and drops. Um, all right, I got uh, two more questions on the chat room. Uh, Kevin, this one will go to you as well. Uh, somebody wrote in and said, can you uh, provide a little bit deeper dive on the um, pinned and non-pinned, how that works, The you know, being able to switch out on an MPO? Um, just, you know, just real quickly to, you know, to hit that one again, really just, you know, think about it from the, from the perspective of, again, that, that gender, that, that male, female approach of, uh, of pinned and, and not pinned. Um, it, it really comes down to how you have your, uh, your network set up to, to, to go to, to that active equipment, how you're going to interface with those MPOs and the cables that you're trying to run to and from, uh, both in the rear and, and in the front. So, Having that ability to to do the, the the gender reversible in the field just enables that if you come across something that uh, a system that's already set up, you have the ability to to both put in new from the perspective of, of having something pinned, and then if you're trying to address things that are already in the network, you have the ability to go back to to non-pinned if you need to have that made ability out there in in something a system that's already uh, installed. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Justin, I have one more for you that just came in and it said, um, so would you start documentation from the from the beginning? And this is kind of, I don't want to say cryptic, but it's, um, let me try to, it says, can you start documentation from the beginning or, and also um, add to it from the field? So I think what the person's asking is, when you when you install it and you have the documentation, does the field then take that and add to it as they as they um, upgrade it? I think that's what he's asking. So yeah, I mean it's always important to take whatever the um, manufacturer provides you, right? Uh, whether it's different fiber panels or different network pieces of equipment, and they they lay out inside their documentation how the fibers should be run to make it successful within their piece of equipment. It's it's imperative that you take that information and use that to make it work within your network, right? So it just because the manufacturer provides it to you and says, this is what we think that you should do, um, won't exactly always fit every single need that would occur in the field. So it's important to go ahead and, and take that feedback from the field and, and update. You know, if you have your own internal documents written for your own uh, um, network within your corporation, uh, to take that information and adjust it to your needs, certainly. Uh, and in some cases, it doesn't always hurt to also take that feedback back to the manufacturer and say, hey, look, you know, we went ahead and tried this. And, and this is something that we noticed when we were working in this type of panel. And it wasn't really working. But when we tried this, it did start to work. And then they can go ahead and make their adjustments accordingly. So, yeah, it's it's always those types of documentation are always living, breathing documents. And they they can always be. Uh, updated, modified, corrected. Yeah. So it's certainly, but you also want to take that information and use it, how it'll work best for you in your uh, situation, right? It's not necessarily something that is set in stone. It's, it's a living, breathing document. So you always want to make those adjustments within your network. Gotcha. Well, I think that, uh, that is all the questions I have that have come through on the chat room. And so as we, uh, as we finish up here, I want to thank the, um, I want to thank the audience for the participation and the questions and just the time. I know everybody's busy, but to be able to take time out and, and jump on a webinar is always, uh, uh, hopefully this will be fruitful for everyone. Uh, also want to thank, uh, Dustin as our subject matter expert. Thank you, man. Appreciate your openness and willingness to be on here. Um, Certainly. Thank you for having me. No, always, man. Thank you. I want to thank our marketing team uh, because uh, without them, we couldn't put these these types of informational 
uh, editorials together for, for folks through a webinar series. And so I want to thank uh, uh, Mary Ellen's group and Nicole and Yelena and Phyllis and, and Barbara um, for uh, putting all this together for Corey helping um, in the background as well. And then uh, Kevin, uh, man, so thankful to have you on here as our uh, senior product manager. Thank you for your time. And you folks, uh, at the end of this, uh, you will, if you've registered, you will be able to get uh, an email will be sent to you with a link. So if you want to go back to this and, re you know, reference it or anything you need, um, you'll have access to it. So I want to thank you guys for for uh, being on and hope to talk to everyone again very soon. Have a great day.